Today, before we go to sleep, we will study Chapter 8 of the book Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill, which was written in 1938. This recording is a treasure trove of insights for your personal development. These insights can be effortlessly absorbed by your mind and later reactivated during your slumber. To gain a deeper understanding of this revolutionary method, please refer to the channel's introductory video. Now, find a comfortable seated position. Inhale deeply into your abdomen, and as you exhale, release any tension. Take a moment to breathe in and breathe out. Now pay close attention and listen carefully with total concentration. Outwitting the Devil Chapter 8 Definiteness of Purpose Q. Your Majesty will now proceed to unfold the secrets of the seven principles through which human beings may force life to provide them with spiritual, mental, and physical freedom. Do not be sparing in your description of these principles. I want a complete illustration of how the principles may be used by anyone who chooses to use them. Tell us all you know about the principle of definiteness of purpose. A. If you go through with this mad idea of publishing my confession, you will open the gates of hell and tom loose all the precious souls I have collected back down through the ages. You will deprive me of souls yet unborn. You will release from my bondage millions now living. Stop, I beg of you. Q, open up. Let's hear what you have to say about the principle of definiteness of purpose. A, you are pouring water on the fires of hell, but the responsibility is yours, not mine. I may as well tell you that any human being who can be definite in his aims and plans can make life hand over whatever is wanted. Q. That is a broad claim, Your Majesty. Do you wish to tone it down a bit? Tone it down? No, I wish to tone it up. When you hear what I now have to say, you will understand why the principle of definiteness is so important. My opposition uses a clever little trick to cheat me of my control over people. The opposition knows that definiteness of purpose closes the door of one's mind so tightly against me that I cannot break through unless I can induce one to form the habit of drifting. Q. Why doesn't your opposition give your secret to all people by telling them to avoid you through definiteness of purpose? You have already admitted that two out of every hundred people belong to your opposition. A. Because I am more clever than my opposition. I draw people away from definiteness with my promises. You see, I control more people than my opposition because I am a better salesman and a better showman. I attract people by feeding them liberally of the thought habits in which they like to indulge. Q. Is definiteness of purpose something with which one must be born or may it be acquired? A. Everyone, as I've told you before, is born with the privilege of being definite. But 98 out of every 100 people lose this privilege by sleeping on it. The privilege of definiteness can be maintained only by adopting it as a policy by which one is guided in all the affairs of life. Q. Oh, I see. One takes advantage of the principle of definiteness just as one may build a strong physical body through constant, systematic use. Is that it? A. You have stated the truth clearly and accurately. Q. Now I think we are getting somewhere, Your Majesty. We have at long last found the starting point from which all who become self-determining in life must take off. We have discovered from your astounding confession that your greatest asset is man's lack of caution, which enables you to lead him into the jungle of indefiniteness through simple bribes. We have learned, beyond the question of doubt, 
that anyone who adopts definiteness of purpose as a policy and uses it in all of his daily experiences cannot be induced to form the habit of drifting. Without the aid of the drifting habit, you are powerless to attract people through promises. Is this correct? A. I couldn't have stated the truth more clearly myself. Q. Go ahead now and describe how people neglect their privilege of being free and self-determining through indefiniteness and drifting. A. I have already made brief reference to this principle, but I will now go into more minute details as to how the principle works. I shall have to begin at the time of birth. When a child is born, it brings with it nothing but a physical body representing the evolutionary results of millions of years of ancestry. Its mind is a total blank. When the child reaches the age of consciousness and begins to recognize the objects of its surroundings, it begins also to imitate others. Imitation becomes a fixed habit. Naturally, the child imitates, first of all, its parents. Then it begins to imitate its other relatives and daily associates, including its religious instructors and school teachers. The imitation extends not merely to physical expression, but also to thought expression. If a child's parents fear me and express that fear within range of the child's hearing, the child picks up the fear through the habit of imitation and stores it away as a part of its subconscious stock of beliefs. If the child's religious instructor expresses any form of fear of me, and they all do in one form or another, that fear is added to the similar fear passed to the child by its parents, and the two forms of negative limitation are stored away in the subconscious mind to be drawn upon and used by me later in life. In a similar way, the child learns by imitation to limit its power of thought by filling its mind with envy, hatred, greed, lust, revenge, and all the other negative impulses of thought which destroy all possibility of definiteness. Meanwhile, I move in and induce the child to drift until I bind its mind through hypnotic rhythm. Q. Am I to understand from your remarks that you have to gain control of people while they are very young or lose your opportunity at them altogether? A. I prefer to claim them before they come into possession of their own minds. Once any person learns the power of his own thoughts, he becomes positive and difficult to subdue. As a matter of fact, I cannot control any human being who discovers and uses the principle of definiteness. Q. Is the habit of definiteness a permanent protection against your control? No, not by any means. Definiteness closes the door of one's mind to me only as long as that person follows the principle as a matter of policy. Once any person hesitates, procrastinates, or becomes indefinite about anything, he is just one step removed from my control. Q. What has definiteness to do with one's material circumstances? I want to know if one may acquire power through definiteness of purpose without inviting destruction through the law of compensation. A. Your question limits my illustrations because there are so few people in the world who understand, and there have been so few in the past who understood, how to use definiteness of purpose without attracting to themselves the negative application of the law of compensation. Here you are forcing me to disclose one of my most prized tricks. I am bound to tell you that I eventually reclaim for my cause all who escape me temporarily through definiteness of purpose. The reclamation is made by filling the mind with greed for power and the love of egotistical expression until the individual falls into the habit of violating the rights of others. Then I step in with the law of compensation and reclaim my victim. Q. So I see from your admission that definiteness of purpose may be dangerous in proportion to its possibility as a power. Is that true? A. Yes, and what is more important, every principle of good carries with it the seed of an equivalent danger. Q. That is hard to believe. 
What danger, for example, can there be in the habit of love of truth? A. The danger lies in the word habit. All habits, save only that of the love of definiteness of purpose, may lead to the habit of drifting. Love for truth, unless it assumes the proportion of definite pursuit of truth, may become similar to all other good intentions. You know, of course, what I do with good intentions. Q. Is love for one's relatives also dangerous? A. The love for anything or anyone, save only the love of definiteness of purpose, may become dangerous. Love is a state of mind which beclouds reason, saps will power, and blinds one to facts and truth. Everyone who becomes self-determining and gains spiritual freedom to think his own thoughts must examine carefully every emotion that seems even remotely related to love. You may be surprised to know that love is one of my most effective baits. With it, I lead into the habit of drifting those whom I could attract with nothing else. That is why I have placed it at the head of my list of bribes. Show me what any person loves most, and I will have my cue as to how that person can be induced to drift until I bind him with hypnotic rhythm. Love and fear, combined, give me the most effective weapons with which I induce people to drift. One is as helpful to me as the other. Both have the effect of causing people to neglect to develop definiteness in the use of their own minds. Give me control over a person's fears and tell me what he loves most, and you may as well mark that person down as my slave. Both love and fear are emotional forces of such stupendous potency that either may completely set aside the power of will and the power of reason. Without will and reason, there is nothing left to support definiteness of purpose. Q, but your majesty... Life would not be worth living if people never felt the emotion of love. You are right as far as your reasoning goes, but you neglected to add that love should be under one's definite control at all times. Of course, love is a desirable state of mind, but it also is a palliative which may be used to limit or destroy reason and willpower, both of which rate above love in importance to human beings who want freedom and self-determination. Q. I understand from what you say that people who gam power must harden their emotions, master fear, and subdue love. Is that correct? People who gain and maintain power must become definite in all their thoughts and all their deeds. If that is what you call hard, then they must become hard. Q. Let us look into the sources of advantage of definiteness in the everyday affairs of life, which is more apt to succeed, a weak plan applied with definiteness, or a sound, strong plan indefinitely applied. Weak plans have a way of becoming strong if definitely applied. Q. You mean that any plan definitely put into continuous action in pursuit of a definite purpose may be successful even if it is not the best plan? Yes, I mean just that. Definiteness of purpose plus definiteness of plan by which the purpose is to be achieved generally succeeds no matter how weak the plan may be. The major difference between a sound and an unsound plan is that the sound plan, if definitely applied, may be carried out more quickly than an unsound plan. Q. In other words, if one cannot be always right, one can and should be always definite. Is that what you are trying to get across to me? A. That is the idea. People who are definite in both their plans and their purposes never accept temporary defeat as being more than an urge to greater effort. You can see for yourself that this sort of policy is bound to win if it is followed with definiteness. Q. Can a person who moves with definiteness of both plan and purpose be always sure of success? No. The best of plans sometimes misfire, but the person who moves with definiteness recognizes the difference between temporary defeat and failure. When plans fail, he substitutes others, but he does not change his purpose. He perseveres. Eventually, he finds a plan that succeeds. Q. 
Will a plan based upon immoral or unjust end succeed as quickly as one motivated by a keen sense of justice and morality? A through the operation of the law of compensation, everyone reaps that which he sows. Plans based on unjust or immoral motives may bring temporary success, but enduring success must take into consideration the fourth dimension, time. Time is the enemy of immorality and injustice. It is the friend of justice and morality. Failure to recognize this fact has been responsible for the crime wave among the youths of the world. The youthful, inexperienced mind is apt to mistake temporary success for permanency. The youth often makes the mistake of coveting the temporary gains of immoral, unjust plans, but neglects to look ahead and observe the penalties which follow as definitely as night follows day. End of chapter 8. Take a moment to breathe in and breathe out. Stay focused and reflect on what you've just heard. In the comments section, share the main message or key takeaway you've gleaned from this recording. This simple task will aid in your reflection and internalization of the information. Remember, repetition is the key. By playing this recording every night before sleep, you're instructing your sleeping mind on what to consolidate. Once you've completed this, head to bed immediately and let your subconscious mind work its magic. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. Good night.